All right, we now welcome onto the podcast Dr. Andy Wolf. Dr. Wolf, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you're a, a research scientist, professor at Tarleton State University. You are a former college coach at Tarleton State and college baseball player. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like you do a lot of things. I mean, you, you've even you've done a lot of research, which we'll get into in baseball. But I've also seen you've done research on on rodeo and things like that. Like I feel like you're you do a lot of different things. What I mean, take me through a little bit of your own your own background. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, where to start? I think, uh, I, th- I think since we kind of mentioned a little bit of research, I can, I can go with that, uh, okay. first. So my research agenda is a uh, pretty broad. And I think part of that is due to how much research I do with students and my students are always interested in different things. And while I do try to complete my own research agenda, I like to allow them to look at things that they may be interested in that tie into what I do as well. But um, my, my overall research agenda kind of falls under this. How do we improve training for various uh, athletic populations? Um, and I just so happen to enjoy the unorthodox populations. Um, and some people may not think baseball is unorthodox, but the way in which we train baseball players absolutely is. Right. It's it's much different than your standard, uh, your typical American football or your basketball players. You know, it's it, it does require a little bit more attention to specific positions, um, uh, whether uh, they're they're hitters, pitchers, both, you know, different positions on the field, all that types of stuff. So I would kind of consider them unorthodox and that that goes in with rodeo as well. So, yeah, I've done quite a bit with rodeo. Um I've been on a couple of podcasts with uh, Champion Living, who's kind of the the uh, like the premier strength conditioning organization out there. So Doug Champion and his crew, um, shout out to them. I've done some stuff with them uh, on some been on some podcasts and talked about the research I've done there, and it's it's been fun. And um, I think in conjunction with that, a lot of what like my specific research relates to is um perceptual rate uh, perceptual regulated um resistance training and how we can self-monitor how how hard we're going or how hard we should be going based off of previous bouts and how we may feel that day and so essentially how do we how do we titrate or modulate our exercise or even our pitching or our hitting or our conditioning based off of a um a what's called a psychophysiological tool. Um, so essentially, how do you feel today? Take that and apply it to your resistance training. So that's what my that's kind of what my research looks like, which is sounds like a mouthful, but no, um, it it yeah. makes sense. And I think in in baseball, uh, specifically hitting in general or softball, because we have softball coaches who listen to this too, just hitting in general, mm-hmm. I think just volume, like understanding kind of what you're just referring to is I mean, like, how do I feel today? Is today a day where I go and take 120 swings? Or maybe it's, hey, let's take 15 or 20 and and we're good. Is there any technology that you use? Because I've seen some technology out there, um, kind of like a little shirt I've seen people wear before that kind of that tracks uh, just, I don't know exactly what it tracks, but it's something to do with volume and um, energy levels and things like that. Is there anything that you've seen or used to help athletes track that? Yeah, so um, I think we're in the era of technology, right? And we're in the era of information more so than anything. And sometimes sifting through a lot of the information that we get from the the black box technology can be difficult. But um, yeah, I've used some different what we call sports science tools where we can look at all right, what's actually happening you know, physiologically, psychologically during sport and, and based off of those, those um, metrics, how can we adjust our performance or adjust our workload based off that? So I've used some things, I think, um, I think probably the most popular one is GPS. Um, And we've looked at how do we, um, how do we increase or decrease workload during season, during games, um, at practice based off of, of, off of those metrics, um, barbell accelerometers 
are all one that we've used. So that's pretty popular right now where we look at um, bar speed, right? Velocity-based training to figure out whether or not we should go or no go. But for for baseball and softball, I think um, the, the arm sleeve, the modus arm sleeves are pretty popular right now in, especially with pitchers to, uh, to gauge where, you know, what their arm angles look like, what their arm velocity may look like as they progress through the game. Hey, are we, are we reaching a threshold uh, of, of fatigue that, you know, is going to significantly impact our performance? Some of those things can come from that, but um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's necessarily a specific formula out quite yet to st- to say, Hey, this is when you should shut it down or, for baseball and softball specifically, or this is when you should um, increase increase that performance. I don't know if there's a technology out yet that that does that, but some of those shirts that you mentioned, they may they may be getting close. They may be getting close. I'm not quite I'm not quite sure on that. So right now, when you're working with players, because I know even though you do, it seems like a million other things, you still make time. You still work with hitters individually. Right mm-hmm. now, is it? Are, are you just? asking them, Hey, how are you feeling today? And then just pretty much going off of that. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think there's an art to it, right? There's an, like you, you've heard that there's an art to coaching. Oh, yeah. Um, you can, you can, I mean, if you've coached long enough, you can tell when a player doesn't feel good. Um, some of your players are, are not going to be honest with you. They're going to tell you they feel good and they actually feel like crap or vice versa. Right they feel fine and they tell you they feel like crap because they don't want to work. Right. But um, yeah, I I think that some of, some of the things that we can look at uh, for hitters in particular is uh, we can look at bat speed. We can look at bat velocity. Uh, We, we should be tracking those, those levels as we go through our, you know, our, our preseason, our off season, our in season. And sometimes we can look at, all right, let's say I've got a blast sensor on the bottom of my bat, which is what we've got here at Tarleton. If, um, if, if we're going out there and we're taking hacks to get our warm up in, and then we're asking them to swing full out and they're substantially lower than what their previous bouts of, of swinging, you know, bat velocities are, if they're, um, if they're, if they're on plane averages, you know, for the, for that, that tracking aspect of it is, you know, constantly off plane and we're not seeing, you know, repeatable, um, uh, I guess, a swing pass towards, towards balls, then that may, that sometimes is an indicator of, well, or what type of, what type of benefit are we actually getting out of this? Right. Are we, are we simply building some mental resilience because I'm making them work when they don't feel good or am I, am I potentially hurting, hurting their swing or hindering their swing and hindering their performance? And we might be better off with a, a, a day of rest. Right. So I think for hitters, that's, that's something that we can look at and we should be looking at other than just, Hey, what's your maximal velocity? Everybody gets uh, excited about what that is, but more so it should be, and we can use it as a tracking device um, from day to day. Yeah. That's one of them you can use. If I'm going to play devil's advocate here, there's a lot of mm-hmm. times throughout the season when you're tired and you, guess what? You still have a game. You still have to play. So what are your thoughts on you got to train that way too? Like there's, you got to figure it out. Like we, even when your swing is maybe a little bit slower, even when things are feeling a little bit off, Hey, like you got a game today. You got to, you got to learn to play tired. Um, that's something that I've heard before too. What would you, is, is that valid in a training environment? No, <laughs> I, would, no. Um, I mean, what's the what's the purpose of, of training? Right. The purpose of training is always to is is to adapt. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the whole idea behind training is we want to change. Right. Mm-hmm. You, you don't go to the gym because you like where you're at. You go to the gym because you want to change your performance. So in training, it's extremely important that we set ourselves up to optimize that change to optimize the adaptation, whether it be neural adaptation, you know, um, cellular adaptation, whatever it may be that you're shooting for. Right. But if it, it, I could ask you the same question, if you went into the gym and you did a heavy hypertrophy workout and you're extremely sore the next day and your coach came back and said, Hey, we're going to do legs again. Is that a good idea? No, but well, I guess what I'm referring to more so is the hitting, the hitting aspect specifically. Yeah. And, and I see where you're at. Like 
do do we have to train? Do we have to be able to be resilient through that? Absolutely. Now, training wise, can we capitalize on the adaptation and titrate, you know, workload based off of how we're actually feeling? We should be doing that because we don't get better when we're when we're working out. We get better when we recover. That's that's simply the how the uh, physiological adaptations occur. So, however, um, do we need resilience? Yeah. Absolutely. Are there different, are there different mechanisms that we could potentially use to enhance the resilience of an individual? Yeah, for sure. Right. Um, what's one that we could do? Um, have we, um, we've seen a lot with, um, like ice baths lately, like the cold plunges. Yeah. Right. I mean, how resilient do you have to be in order to get into that thing? How mentally tough do you have to be to get into, you know, 40, 30 degree weather? right? Get in there and you have to stay in there for an extended period of time. Oh, and by the way, when you're in there and that, that during that time, Hey, let's have a coach asking you math questions, right? So <laughs> now you've got to think why you don't feel good, right? So can we train resilience without hindering physiological, you know, training and adaptation? I think we can, I think we should. I think a lot so, of people are going to steal that idea that you just gave. <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> I hope they do. I mean, that would, um, you, you'd save your athletes some fatigue. You'd see some better improvements in their your physical performance. Um, and you may see a little bit of enhanced, uh, enhanced recovery from the ice, ice bath. Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Yeah, but yeah. So uh, take me through, I know you, we'll, we'll talk a, a couple about a couple of your studies here, but why, why do studies on, I know you've done different things on grip strength. You've done some stuff on pitchers. Mm -hmm. is it a curiosity thing something that maybe you didn't know as a, a player or as a coach and you're like man i, I want to dig deep here and, and get some other people involved and, and do a study on this like what yeah. what are some of the reasons why you go and you decide to do a a study on a particular subject so um i think i think it's always curiosity right i think that um i mean if we look at a research philosophy Right. The, the purpose of of going after education is curious, is, is we're simply curious. And as we become more educated and as we discover more, typically our curiosity increases and increases and increases and increases. Right. So well, our, our curiosity for something is constantly or should be, I would assume, constantly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and what we find is as we do more studies at the end of every study, you read what is there. There is suggestions for future research mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of research comes from you know after that initial study so um for me with like in in particular with some of the grip strength stuff uh it, it similar to what you said with hitters is okay can we take some sports science approaches and use grip strength to potentially modulate our pitching performance or pitching load or our throwing load for that day same with hitters can we take that grip strength and modulate for um for hitting hitting load that day whether we're using you know underweight bats overweight bats you know standard bat weight some of that stuff i think that's really interesting is to me is how do i get real specific with my training based off of a quantitative measure of neuromuscular fatigue or neuromuscular readiness, which would be simply grip strength. Um, so, yeah. So the study was correlation between grip strength at various arm orientations and hitting performance metrics of division one collegiate baseball players. That's the name of the study. Uh, what was your hypothesis before you started the study? And then was there anything that was like, wow, like a aha moment throughout the study for you? Yeah. So, um, the, kind of the, so first off the, the reason behind that one was, um, our coach at the time here at Tarleton, Aaron Mead, who's, um, who's now at, um, the municipal community college out in Kansas city. Um, great coach, um, brilliant mind, really innovative and, and open to, you know, different ideas with, with baseball. Um, we wanted to know, Hey, what, what, what metrics matter? Right. What metrics matter within grip strength? What metrics matter within the blast sensors? Like, I don't know how familiar you are with blast sensors or our listeners are with blast sensors, but good gosh, they give us so many different pieces of data 
that, that sometimes it's difficult to determine whether or not that's some good information. Um, and then also with the um, with the Yakker Tech, right, soft, uh, um, piece of equipment, we use that to um, to look at exit velocity of the ball and that type of stuff. So we wanted to see, all right, which one of these metrics really matter? Um, I think that we can all assume that exit velocity is important. Right. I think, I think that's pretty, uh, I think that's pretty clear. So if we look at a, a particular performance metric, exit velocity is important. Um, so how do we get greater exit velocities? Well, my hypothesis was I'm assuming based off of the biomechanics of the swing, if, if we get an individual into a 90 degree, right neutral grip slash supinated grip while hitting. And if they've got some elevated levels of grip strength in that position and with the dominant hand, and then also, you know, the, um, in the, in the other hand, 90 degrees, again, just the opposite, right? So I would think that if they're, if they're in pronation and they have some significant grip strength there, that that may have some correlation with, um, you know, their performance or their exit velocity, um, so that was what I hypothesized, which um, it ended up being pretty close, right? We ended up being pretty close with that. Um, so um, why why did we look at these different arm angles? I think um, I think within your recent post, you you cited a particular study. I think it was by it was it Hughes in two thousand four. Yep. That um, hey they they found that they took they took people through six weeks of grip strength training experimental group people that didn't do any grip strength training through that control group both groups saw increased velocity in in you know uh in in bat speed but no difference between the groups so in baseball we for some reason have this anecdotal thought that grip strength is the end all be all to hitting performance right well that was that was something I wanted to figure out. All right. They're saying it doesn't matter. Everybody's still saying it does matter. Okay. Maybe it's more about the different angle of strength and the different arm orientation that matters. And that's essentially what we found was yes, grip strength is, is important, but it's specific grip strength that is important that is, the, is contributing to our elevated performance levels in our swing. Specific grip strength and and just just because I want to clarify for everyone listening at certain positions throughout the swing, correct? Mm -hmm. So, correct. For, as from a, as a coach, not knowing what you know now, how would you advise players to train? How would you advise coaches, knowing that there's specific positions that you know they need to really be strong in and so i guess what i'm my next or let me i'll, I'll let you answer that question I, I have a lot of questions okay yeah yeah so what is what is training look like um so i'm gonna i'm gonna jump on my computer so i can kind of show you some of these particular statistics here that that i ran into with mine so i can reference it specifically um but out of the dominant hand right out of the dominant hand we took we took the um to the top hand. hand. Yeah, the top hand, dominant hand. Um, we took the hand dynamometer, right? And we measured, you know, what's what's the output, what's the force production out of that in um in in, in I think we did it in pounds in this particular case. Um, um so we took the grip strength from a 90 degree elbow bend with hand dynamometer, neutral grip, supinated, pronated, and then we moved it into 120 degrees. Elbow, um, elbow flexion and then shoulder abduction at 90 degrees. And we did that same protocol, supinated grip, neutral grip, pronated grip, right? So did any of these grips matter at two different, essentially two different time points in the swing? Maybe if, maybe up in here, kind of in a starting position and hitting position or even a throwing position, which we'll, we'll take some of that data and correlate it with our throwing velocity later with hitters. And then we looked at, okay, at contact, which is typically in approximately 90 degrees elbow bend, right? That's where we're most, that's where we see some optimal contact, right? Which, which one of those grip strengths mattered. And it was neutral grip. It was neutral grip that had the significant correlation with several different metrics that came from the blast sensors. And then also came from the, the Yakertech, right? So 
from that information, um, we, we can look at it and we can go, okay, how do we train? Uh, okay. We've got to put our, our, our position players. We got to put our hitters in positions in the weight room where the neutral grip is going to be utilized. So does it matter if I'm doing pull-ups with an overhand, with an overhand grip or with a soup, with a uh, pronated grip? Uh, maybe not as much, right? Maybe I need to flip them to more of a neutral grip position, right? Um, or maybe I need to flip them into a supinated grip position. So maybe we need to get away from pull-ups that are just in that standard pronated position and move them into a position that's going to increase their grip strength in, again, that 90-degree elbow bend. Um, so a lot of our rowing um, activities, maybe even some of our pressing activities, we stay in a more neutral grip um, because those that grip strength seems to contribute to or is correlated with those performance metrics. Kind of the same thing with your non-dominant hand. So we saw that one was was interesting. We saw a little bit of negative correlation with supinated grip, right, at elbow, at 90 degree elbow flexion. Um, and then we saw positive with pronated, which again makes perfect sense, right? Because that contact, where's our, where's our bottom hand or our non-dominant hand? Well, at contact, it's in a pronated grip. Pronated, yeah. right? So it makes sense that we should have some very good grip strength at that particular angle so um training our grip strength in those particular angles may be um more conducive to improves performance i don't know specifically what the protocol looked like from the study that was published in 2004 i don't know what that grip strength um protocol looked like um but i'm assuming it wasn't specific to what we found in, in our recent publication of these specific angles are correlated more with the outcomes versus just quote grip strength. How did you utilize the, the blast motion throughout the, like, I mean, I just saw that you, there was a lot of different metrics within your study, but uh, I mean, like there's bat speed, there's, you know, attack angle, things like that, which I don't know how relevant maybe some of those metrics were to your specific study, but were there any, like, how did you utilize that? specifically in the study the the entire blast sensor yeah so the the way that we collected that data um we had um we had our uh hitters come out and obviously had their, their blast sensors they'd gone through a warm-up um and we had a standardized pitch velocity coming off of a, a machine and it was plugged into a specific location and what we asked those hitters to do was, you know, hit this ball as, as hard as you possibly can. And we took we took an average out of out of 10 swings in each one of those categories, took the average velocity, took the average, you know, um, uh, wh whatever all those metrics are, attack angle, power, you know, plane of efficiency, all those different ones, took the average of those. And then those that was the variable or that was a number for each one of those variables that we then ran Pearson's product moment correlation with in order to see, okay, did their hitting performance have anything to do with what they did in the lab, which was a bunch of grip strength stuff. Um, so that's how we use that there. And then at the same time that they, we were getting um, uh, blast sensor data, we had the yak set up on the field to where it could then register exit velocity. So we had exit velocity coming from each one of those blast sensor swings so then we could then track it back to, all right, did our blast sensor, we could actually look at that to, did our blast sensor have any correlation with our uh, yak, you know, sensor essentially. So which one of these metrics work in regards to, you know, uh, exit velocity, which one of these matter with um, trajectory, all that different data that comes from your yak. So peak power, you know, average power, that stuff. So that's kind of how we conducted that study. How did the other people involved in the study react to kind of the findings or was there coaches involved too? Like who else was involved in the study? Yeah. So obviously all the players are involved. Um, we try not to tell them a whole lot of anything. We just say, Hey, go do this. Right. Cause we don't want to skew our data and tell them, Hey, this is what we're, this is what we hypothesize we're looking for. You know, no, we, we, we want them to just do everything as hard as they possibly can and just play like normal. Um, our coaches, we had all the coaches involved. Um, they, um, uh, 
they were thoroughly, um, uh, thoroughly. I, I don't want to, I don't want to say impressed, but they they enjoyed having the lab come out, examine their players, and come up with some specific, you know, training uh, uh, training goals for them. Some specific grip strength stuff that they can look at, and they also got to see all right. What is what does this blast sensor actually mean? Which one of these blast data actually have anything to do with our yak data? You know, does which one of these grip strength metrics have something to do with that as well? So they were um, extremely a, a thankful for a, you know having having researchers come out and and poke on their athletes a little bit, and then they they enjoy they enjoy the data just like any other baseball player. We we love stats. We love data. The more data we can get, the better we feel because um, we may we think we may have an answer to uh, accomplishing something greater than a 30 percent batting average, which is never going to happen. But um, we get a little closer. And um, so they enjoy it. They uh, they are um, um, they feel, I guess, more informed about some of the stuff that they're doing previously or they were doing previously and then the stuff that they end up doing in the future they can make some informed decisions. Yeah. Were, were they doing like a ton of extra grip stuff before and, and now maybe they've tailored it a little bit or was there anything specific <laughs> that they changed after doing this study? Um, they, I, I don't know how much grip strength they were doing before, to be honest, because I don't have any control of what their strength conditioning program looks like, nor do I have any control over what their, um, their at field, um, routine looks like. Uh, but what I do know is they did take this information and share it with their strength coach. They took this information and they shared it, you know, with their assistant coaches that were helping out with assisting with, with baseball, um, you know, uh, I guess practice plans and stuff like that. And some of that stuff from, from what I was told was integrated in this, Hey, we need to work on grip strength here. We need to work on grip strength here. Um, and so one of the things that I talked to them about was, hey, let's 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 define strength. So that's that's always a big one with with the baseball population is, hey, let's define strength. What are we doing for grip strength? Oh, well, we're doing 100, you know, you know, I, I don't know, flexion you know, exercises. Right. Or we're doing uh, or we're doing, you know, barbell rolls. We're doing we're doing 50 of these things. Right. So uh, is that strength? Right. No, absolutely not. Now we're training endurance. So that was something else that we got to we got to talk with them about is not only do we need to train at these specific angles. These are important for your your, your position players, for your hitters. It's also important to make sure that we're using the correct um, sets, reps, acute variables to achieve the adaptation you want, which is power and strength out of the out of the you know the the flexors right for for grip strength purposes um and we do that by extreme heavy loads right fast fast contractions minimal repetitions right so instead of just taxing these things to where you know we feel the burn or anything like that maybe it's more about hey we need to increase you know neural drive and we need to learn that uh that's just as important as you know the endurance that you guys typically have have sought after in the past with our quote grip strength again quote grip strength exercises would that be the case for all things lifting for baseball players as they want to focus on lifting essentially heavy stuff fast yeah oh yeah absolutely you know, like, no um, matter what time of the year whether it's in season versus off season like same thing um i think that um i think it changes a little bit between um within your season so you have obviously you have a postseason after you're done playing and you have your off season preseason in season and the training goal should change a little bit within each one of those um also the workload should change so the training frequency how often we're training the amount of of weight we're lifting you know in the in the gym is going to train or is going to change obviously increase with with off season start to lower back down between preseason. It's going to be relatively low during in season. Um, but there's, there's specific times during the year when I think it's appropriate to hypertrophy, right? We, we want to increase 
cross-sectional area. We want to increase the size of our fibers. If we can increase the size of our, of our muscles, well, then we have the capacity to create more force. If we can create more force and then we learn how to create that same amount of force in a short period of time, that equals power, which is what we're looking for in baseball. So I think, you know, going through each one of those types of um, training goals is appropriate leading up into season to where, you know, in season, we want to be as powerful and as fast as we possibly can. So that's kind of the recipe that I follow with training is let's get you a little bigger, get you a little stronger. And now let's work on getting you really, really fast based off of that foundation that we built. Um, so that's, that's how I train. What would be the amount of reps that you refer to when you say like, not necessarily a lot of reps, like for someone out there listening, usually the, the generic is what eight to 10 reps, three sets of an exercise, then moving on to the next one. And you're saying what, four to six reps instead, and, and trying to just move as so you can add more weight, less reps, and then move, but still trying to move it as fast as possible. Yeah. So there's, there's some, some different um, prescriptions that we can look at to achieve those different physiological adaptations. Um, typically when we look at hypertrophy, so gaining muscle mass, um, failure is what we want to get to. That's what we found recently within the literature is sometimes it doesn't matter the load. It's, it's more about, Hey, you need to get to muscle failure. Right. So, so even if you could go, even if you're benching like just 135, it you can still gain muscle just can, if you just go to failure. Yeah, that's what we're finding. Yep. We can get to failure. We can we can hypertrophy the muscle. However, the I mean, if we look at the National Strength Conditioning Association's, you know, prescriptions, um, we for hypertrophy, we want to be approximately two to four sets, sometimes a little more, depending on your athlete at, um, at six to 12 repetitions. And the, the load is going to be between 67% of your one rep max and 85% of your one rep max. So that's going to be this prescription that you would use for gaining muscle or hypertrophying. Um, strength and power are going to be very similar. Um, Strength is usually less than six repetitions, anywhere from three to six sets. And you're looking at loads of over 85% of your one rep max. So anything from 85 and up. And then power, power is a little different because we have to look at the demands of that particular position. So position players are different than pitchers, right? Pitchers have to produce mass amounts of power multiple times throughout a game, right? Yeah, they have a little break within there, but they have to be able to do it again and again and again and again, right? Position players are a little different. We only have to produce power once every now and then, right? So, we, so we're so we more of a, a single effort, effort um, athlete versus a pitcher where I'd consider them to be a multiple effort athlete because they don't have, they don't have near as much rest time in between swings or rest time in between bursts of acceleration in the outfield or running bases, something like that. So those, they change a little bit with power. So um, it with power, the, the objective is moving fast, right? Extremely fast. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that anywhere from, from like 65 to probably 85 is going to be that range for your pitchers. And then if we can increase that just slightly, for our position players so probably 75 to 95 somewhere in there and repetitions are really low so we need probably like five and under um, and then sets are very similar to strength so we're looking at you know three to six sets of that with ample rest in between and our objective is move that bar move that weight as fast as you possibly can are there certain exercises that you would recommend for all position players? Maybe we'll start out with them. All position players need to be doing. Oh, golly. I don't know if there's, I, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday actually about like about exercises and we got on the topic of overhead press, right? Is overhead press a bad thing? Well, it will no. overhead press isn't a bad exercise. No exercise is a bad exercise. I, I take that back for some of my people out there, they may get mad at me, but some of the stuff that we do in CrossFit, yeah, that, those are some bad exercises, right? But uh, I mean, come on, we don't need to be doing kip and pull-ups. Let's just do a, let's just do a pull-up, 
Um, or what's the point, right? What are we trying to achieve? Um, but certain exercises aren't necessarily bad as long as we have the physical capacity to complete them correctly, right? So an overhead press is going to require, you know, 180 degrees of shoulder flexion, right? And 180 degrees of shoulder flexion without any pain, without any impingement. How many of our pitchers and baseball players can do that? Well, not very many. So that's the reason it gets such a bad rap in our community. But I have, I have buddies that I played ball with that could do overhead press and never had a problem with it because they had, you know, great scapula uh, kinematics. They could get that scapula to, you know, upwardly rotate. Great. I, I'm a prime example. I can't get to 120 or 120 degrees shoulder flexion. It seems like at times, but I mean, I'm getting old and stiff. So, um, so what exercises should we be doing? I'd say um, anything to where we can, we can move, we can move the scapula, right? So any of our pressing variations, any of our, our rowing variations, I don't ever want to pin that, those scapulas down. I want those things to move, right? So a lot of times your bench press gets, gets, gets thrown out, right? Your standard barbell bench press gets thrown out, not because it's necessarily dangerous, right? It's because it, pins the scapula down and it asks you to move with those stuck in place. We want, we want them to move. We want them to rotate along, along the rib cage because that's what's going to happen when we're actually thrown is that scapula is going to upwardly rotate. It's going to anteriorly tilt a little bit whenever we go into that extension and then that pronation when we're throwing. So we've got to allow it to, to move and it's got to be strong in those different positions. So upper body wise, let's make sure that that thing's moving. And then lower extremity wise, I think um, uh, I don't want to say completely steer clear of bilateral lifts. So like things where your feet are in the exact same position. So like a squat or a standard deadlift, you don't have to completely steer clear of those, but just recognize that, hey, we as baseball players, we're, we're not going to be symmetrical. It's mm. that's just the that's just the nature of the beast. Um, we want to try to get back to you know, symmetrical positions where our hips are in alignment and our, you know, and we have good alignment with, you know, with our feet where one's not externally rotated more than the other, you know, we don't have greater internal rotation on the right side than we do the left side. So we want, we want to try to achieve symmetry, but also recognize that, you know, that that's not necessarily going to happen with most of us. So I kind of steer clear from like your typical squat. And I use a lot of unilateral exercises to promote strength because we tend to be better at controlling that single leg movement and putting our, our limbs in a good quality position whenever we just have to worry about one of them and the other side's not necessarily um, hindering us or putting us in a suboptimal position. So I, I, I always recommend single leg, you know, single leg movements, lower body or unilateral, also unilateral movements, lower body um, and unilateral movements, upper body. OK, the same thing's going to happen up top. We're going to have we're going to have some movement deficiencies and we're going to have some we're going to have some postural asymmetries. And we can bat that by um, recognizing, you know, wh where our where our deficiencies are and then, you know, train, train one limb at a time. That's how I mean, and that's how the sports plays. Right. We we uh, we move one limb at a time. Typically, very seldom do we do we use just we do we use both feet at the same time or both arms at the same time in the same plane of motion. Very, very interesting, because and, and again, you've spent way more time studying this stuff than I have. I know enough to be dangerous, but that's about it. Um, and so and the reason why I, I say that, because I've read online, I've read a few articles here and there over the years and followed some people on Twitter. And it seems that I've heard a few times that uh, people say that that deadlift it would be like the best bang for your buck exercise for a baseball player. And so what you're saying, I mean, it, it makes sense the way you're saying it is like, look, how often are we actually going to be in that position where it'd be more beneficial to be in, you know, training single leg, unilateral, all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I just I just find it interesting because I've, I've read a few times that that certain people who I won't name have said deadlift would be the best one for baseball players. So I'm, I'm really glad I asked that question because you, you're, you kind of contradict that, which I think is interesting. Yeah. And I, and I, I mean, I love the deadlift. I really do. I think it's a great exercise, you know, outside of just baseball, it's very functional. 
I mean, at, at some point in our lives, we're going to have to pick something up off the ground. And if we can, if we can pick something up, that's, you know, 400, 500 pounds, it makes it really easy when something's 50 pounds and we don't injure ourselves near, near frequently outside of, you know, the gym, whenever we've prepared ourselves. So I think the objective is always to be able to live life without, you know, vigorous, you know, uh, fatigue and stuff like that. So that's where training comes into play. Um, my colleague, one of my colleagues here, he's a mentor of mine and he's, he's probably in his, you know, late seventies and we get to joking because we say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to hurt ourselves for one hour a day. That way the remaining 23 hours of the day, we don't hurt where everybody else that's not exercising, you know, is hurting for 23 hours out of the day but they feel good for, you know, a couple or a little bit here and there when they're sitting still or laying down or something like that. So um, I think that's the objective of training eventually, but for baseball, I mean, deadlift them. Yeah. It's a great exercise. Um, a lot of times I will have our athletes, I'll have my athletes stagger their feet. Right. So I'll have them stagger their feet a little bit with that deadlift or yeah, go into a single leg position. If you can so you have, when you say stagger your feet, like one in front of the other, one in front of the other. Yep. And then switching. Right. So that, that kind of helps with a little bit of the, the hip alignment issues that we, we commonly run into with baseball players. All right. Well, we have some, some hip alignment issues. Well, let's put us in that position, straighten our feet out nice and uh, nice and straight, do our best to, to recognize where we're at. And then, Hey, let's combat it and go the opposite direction that we're not used to doing. So it, it makes us strong in the position that we need to be. And then it reinforces going, you know, into some uh, kind of almost like a corrective strategy to fix some of those asymmetries. Um, if you can get your hands on like a, um, if you can get your hands on a hex bar or a trap bar and do that, it's, I mean, it's great. They get a bang for your buck. Hey, maybe that's the one is your staggered stance, you know, deadlift. It's a great one. Um, but I, I, I'd be careful pinpointing one exercise that's going to just, improve everything right there's uh, i don't know if we're if we're there yet within our uh within our knowledge of the sport to where we can say hey if you are this good at this exercise we can predict your performance i don't think we're there yet i think moneyball has taken us a long way but i especially with with training and resistance training and exercise like that i don't think that we can necessarily say this exercise is is the one for performance i just don't think we can say that are a lot of strength coaches utilizing what you just said for deadlifts of like staggering one foot in front of the other and then flipping back and forth because again i've never heard of that before um i hope so <laughs> <laughs> i hope so uh i don't know if they're actually using it but i think that the information's out there right um again we live in the age of information where there's so much of it out there um, if we figure out how to sift through it and find the good stuff and figure out how to use it appropriately, um, you know, we can be, like, like you said, we can be very deadly and, and very productive in our, in our training. Um, I think there's some really good ones out there that are doing some of this stuff that spend a lot of their time, not just training, but learning, right? They're curious, right? Kind of the whole reason why we continue to research further and further into topics, we're curious about it. And I think that the good strength coaches out there are those that that learned and built a good foundation and then continue to stay curious on how to constantly improve their programs and improve, um, you know, the mechanisms that they're using to improve their their athletes. So uh, education is key for the good the good strength coach, in my opinion. Who, who do you like out there? What strength coaches uh, across the country? Maybe you follow or, or know personally, like who are some of your favorites? Yeah. So, um, one of my good friends, Joel Rather, he's at fast performance out of Denver, Colorado. Um, shout out to him. He's, he's outstanding. Um, he's a great, great guy. Um, he works with, he works with a lot of unorthodox sports too. So it, being from Texas, um, hockey's unorthodox for us. Um, lacrosse is kind of unorthodox. He works with both of those a lot. He works with a lot of, um, he and he and some of his colleagues within his facility, they work with, um, uh, obviously your winter sports, your skiers, your snowboarders, stuff like that. So those are kind of your non-traditional sports, but he also works with a lot of baseball players too. So he's got a lot of baseball players that come in and, and he's, he's got a great facility out there in Denver. Um, and then I, I think it, 
uh, I think that everybody knows Eric Cressy. I think Cressy's one of the the greatest. He's, I mean, people call him the shoulder guy because he is like, he knows what he's doing there. Um, he's trained lots of players over the years. Um, I've followed Cressy since, oh God, probably back in 2006, 2007, when he really started, started going and um, he does great stuff. Um, so he, the, those two guys are, are some of the, some of the good ones. Um, man, there's, oh, I mean, it, those, those are kind of my big two that, that I'll follow. And, and Joel and I are good buddies and, and, um, we talk, we were talking last night and we talk more about hunting and fishing now at this point, um, <laughs> that we do baseball and performance, but, um, yeah, we bounce ideas off of each other here and there. And, um, but he's, he's a good one. And like I said, Chris, he's a good one to follow too. If you just want to consume tons and tons of information. Yeah, I haven't heard of Joel before, but I'll have to look him up and, and start following him. But obviously, yeah, in the baseball world, who, who, yeah, everybody knows who Eric Cressy is and very highly respected. Uh, the last question that I have for you is, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's it's become more of a thing lately, specifically for hitting training hitters. But I see a lot of diff and pitchers too, a lot of like water bags training. I don't yeah. know if you've seen that or not yet. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've seen some people say it's man, it's all anecdotal and it's not like, there's nothing, there's no actually facts behind doing that stuff. And then it's other people are all on board. What, what's your take on this? I feel like you would be the perfect person to ask. So it, I mean, it's, it's simply another training modality. Right. Um, and if, if we look at, you know, the, the water bag training, what, what are we creating with that? Um, well, we're creating what we'd call like a proprioceptive enriched environment, right? We're creating instability in a very controlled manner, which is going to breed stability, right? Anytime that we can breed stability, we, we increase the, I think the foundational capacity for improving strength and hypertrophy and power, right? Um, so I think it's great in controlling um, and teaching ourselves and our in, in our musculature how to um, control these different positions and and fire these particular muscles at specific times in order to maintain that balance and that's what balance is and stability is. Um, they're a lot like vibration training. I mean, if we think about it, the water's moving around from side to side, up and down. That's essentially what vibration training is. So it's a different mode that is, again, creating an environment that's unstable, yet it's relatively safe. Um, so they've been they've been around for a while. Um, I, I think the the way we use them is um, uh, we, we build and we use them as a foundation. That'd be my that'd be my recommendation. Um, I would also probably I haven't used them a whole lot. Um, just it's it's another piece of equipment. Right. And usually another piece of equipment is 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 funding. Right. You've got to have the funding in order to go out and buy the equipment. Um, but if I were using them, I would probably use them as like a almost like a neuro neuro prep prior to my my primary exercise. If I'm using them within like a resistance training routine. So I may do you know, some of those exercises where I'm, I'm, you know, simply doing, you know, overhead, you know, or half overhead exercises, you know, to create some stability within the cuff and, you know, have it fire at different locations. Yeah. Essentially you're getting the same type of um, reactive strength and reactive um, contractions that you get. If you flipped a, a kettlebell upside down and held a kettlebell and walked with it, right. You're trying to stabilize it from falling side to side, backwards, forwards, um, but I'd use it as a, Hey, let's turn, let's turn the nervous system on. Um, let's, let's prep it and make sure that it's good and stable and firing the way that it's supposed to be firing before we jump into something that's more extreme. Um, that's probably what I would use them for primarily. So that would be really good movement prep before you start hitting, before you start throwing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great, great warm up activity um, for those two uh, pieces of in baseball is I'm um, sure use it. Um, do we use it with power? Maybe, right. Can we use it as a, as a way to decelerate, right? If we accelerate it hard one direction, get ready because it's going to bring more force as that water sloshes this direction. Then we're going to have to decelerate it when it sloshes back in the other direction. So I think that, you know, some of the, the, uh, unfamiliar deceleration forces that you would experience from it could help with 
your deceleration, you know, when, and that's, that's when we get injured, right. Is if we don't decelerate appropriately. So I think that could be, you know, a utilization for that modality as well is, you know, improving deceleration mechanics at different, you know, in different, um, whether it be lower extremities, upper extremities, different movement planes as well. Awesome. I'll tell you what, Dr. Wolf, you're the man. I appreciate you coming on today. Um, I'm going to link um, link the study. I put it out in my newsletter a few weeks ago, but I'll, I'll link the study in, in the show notes of this too. But if someone wants to like follow you, connect with you, like, is there a good place for them to do that? Or is it just like, Hey, I'm on my own here. Yeah, no, I am. Um, so my, my personal Instagram page um, is a, a wolf. Um, that's my personal page. So if you want to check out me and my family and, and what we have going on down here in Texas, that's that one. But um, kind of my consultant page is um, Wolf and Sons Performance. So Wolf is W-O-L-F-E. And then Sons is just S-O-N-S. And then Performance. Wolf and Sons Performance would be my, my uh, you can get on Instagram. I'm on there. Um, Facebook, I'm on there too. I don't do much with Twitter. A uh, little bit of tiktok here we got to get but, you on twitter man that's where all the baseball people and softball people are i know a lot out there i really you're right i probably need to tap into that um because it's really not that difficult that you know from what i've seen you just with your sense. knowledge too i feel like you would like you would really help a lot of people i think on there well maybe maybe um maybe that'll be my goal this upcoming month i try to set some some monthly goals and maybe getting on on twitter and posting occasionally uh to to help get on that platform would be good for me but um but yeah so that you can you can instant uh, message me on either of those platforms you can look me up through tarleton's website and email me through my work email or even through my my uh consultant email which is just wolf and sons dot performance at gmail.com and um yeah i'm open for questions and comments and all that type of stuff just um i'm i'm a professor and, and i'm here to research and i'm here to educate and that's what i like to do so um yeah anytime that you guys have questions or you have questions patrick and people out there you know hit me up we're i'm an open book appreciate anytime. it man appreciate absolutely. you coming on absolutely been enjoying